apologize for the sniffling this morning, as, uh, <laughs> as has already been noted, it's a little chilly in here. Uh, I thought this morning about bringing back in the Advent can wreath and, and lighting those candles, and we could all huddle around the fire, but I thought, well, that's just a whole lot of work. And the heater is on, and will get warmer, and you all will contribute to that. We are in the middle of a four-week series looking at the three goals that uh, Holy Conversations set before our congregation. And those three goals uh, we summarize with the words participate, know, and connect. Because we like to confuse you, Gerald and I have been working backwards through those, and so the last two weeks we spent looking at connect First week, looking at what does it mean and what does it look like to reconnect with ourselves and with others. And last week, we talked about what does it look like for us to reconnect and connect with God. This week, we'll be looking at know uh, and our need to know better. From the Next Steps report, they, uh, what know means is to, to know one another better and to know ourselves, not just knowing names and little factoids, but knowing on a deeper level, knowing what God has gifted each of us with as as far as spiritual gifts as well as skills, talents, and gifts for ministry so that we might employ those to be builders of that kingdom. For those, uh, for these two weeks and, 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 and this whole series we've been looking at and listening to this passage from John 21. This was the passage that Holy Conversations identified and used as a lens that that they thought both captured where we are as a congregation and where we might seek to go. It captures the setting, the experience of many of us here at First United Methodist Church of San Marcos, and that is we feel like we are those disciples that we're, do- we're just going along doing the things we've kind of always done and the things we know to do, doing church the way we've seen church done, and, and, and yet we feel like we're not getting the same results. In a way, we've gone fishing, but that's about as far as we got because we haven't really caught anything. Whether or not you agree with the Holy Conversations group and their assessment of where we are, that's the word that the group brought to us, that we feel like we're going to do the work that we've always done, and yet we're not feeling like we get the same results that maybe we once did. This passage, as we've noted the last few weeks, comes at the very, well not very end, but the close to the very end of John's Gospel. And the disciples it's no doubt know each other very well at this time. Just think of the amount of time that they have spent together, ministering with, learning from, being corrected by Jesus. Think of all that time. I mean, just imagine. Who who among us would not want to spend every waking hour with all of our church people? Yeah? Any takers? Okay, I didn't think so. But that was the life of the disciples, living, sleeping, breathing, and eating, being fed by this fellowship, being fed by their Lord. They spent time with each other, they did work together, and they did a whole lot of other stuff together as well. And they did this for so long and for such an extended period of time that they no doubt had a deep knowledge of one another. When someone really knows you, they know the good and the not so good. As we were visiting this week to prepare for today's sermons, I confessed to Pastor Gerald that I was having a really hard time connecting what we were hoping to achieve and what we're looking to achieve through know and knowing each other to this passage. I just wasn't seeing a connection, and I thought, well, I can build bridges, but they might fall over. Finding a way to connect this to the no part, and then it was in that moment when I confessed, I, I, got, I really got nothing here, that I received a gift of what it is to read Scripture and to talk about Scripture and community. 
which is the gift of someone else who noticed something that might familiar ears and eyes had started to tune out. Peter was naked. He was naked. And as Gerald pointed out, even though they may not have the same approach to clothing and covering yourself up that we do, they weren't along the lines of of the Roman baths where it was just kind of everybody's free and nothing matters, not even clothes matter. And so, in a way, this this passage is, is demonstrating the disciples' deep knowledge and comfort with each other. Because Peter was willing to strip down naked. And as I thought more and more about that, we, I remembered back to, to, to what nakedness meant in the beginning. That nakedness wasn't just about a lack of clothing or a lack of covering up. It was about vulnerability. Being vulnerable with each other. There's a level of comfort, there's a level of familiarity, and a level of trust that the disciples no doubt had. And as Gerald pointed out, I'm sure Peter wasn't the only one. It's just the only one we have mention of being naked and then dressing himself. But they knew each other well. I don't know how many of you actually know how I got here. It was by car this morning. It's not what I mean by how I got here, but why I'm here, why I'm here doing the things that I do, what brought me here. A quick snapshot, I was a homebody as a child. I wanted nothing but to stay home, and I didn't have a whole lot of friends, and we moved around a fair amount, and every move seemed to be difficult for me, and the last move before I graduated from high school I just really wanted to clam up and stay at home with the people that loved me and that wanted me around because I wasn't sure that anybody else did want me around. And so when my parents started forcing me to go to church, I resisted. And when they started forcing me to go to Sunday school, I resisted. And when they started forcing me to go to youth group, I resisted. And then something happened. And I can tell you more later if you're interested. But I was drawn in. I was drawn in by greetings from the youth, from the youth group, and from the youth leaders. I was drawn in by their welcome. And I was attracted to the fact that see, here in this place, in this church, I had found other people who seemed to want me around. And not only that, they wanted to get to know me. That group, they pulled others in. They greeted one another. I told Gerald that one of the memories that is imprinted on my brain is the memory of of us gathering for youth group in the fellowship hall. And the fellowship hall had an exterior door that uh, the whole room had a lack of windows. And then there was an exterior door. And so every time someone would open up the door to come in for, for youth supper, There was a spill of light and all of the heads would turn towards that door and would see the person and most times we knew them. If not, we usually knew the person who brought them and they would shout and it was always along this line, Russell, whatever your name was, it was a big and then a letdown. But it wasn't a bad letdown, it was a, I am so excited to see you, I can't believe you're here. It was like that with everybody. And I wanted desperately to be one of those everybodies. The youth group had what I would call a cheers culture. You remember cheers? Norm, right? (laughs) The strong desire to pull in and get to know each other was the culture. And it was impossible to deny It was impossible to resist, and I have been craving that culture ever since. 
But more than knowing each other and wanting each other to be around, this culture of knowing wasn't simply a warm fuzzy. It wasn't the surface level stuff. It was a culture of concern for one another. It was a culture of trust. It was a culture of challenge and a culture of care. It wasn't too much longer after I took the bait and started appearing voluntarily, insisting that I go to youth group, that I was on a choir tour, and I don't remember the circumstances, but I was a, just finished my freshman year in high school, and for some reason, all of the upperclassmen had not joined the choir tour. And it was me and two of my other friends who had just finished our freshman year. We were the oldest on the trip. And I enjoyed what I had come to know, which is a place where I could be myself, goofy, happy-go-lucky, seldom serious, just wanting to laugh and have a good time. And I remember sitting on a picnic table on a, be- on a beach in Florida, and when all of the craziness went away, people went swimming, my friend Beth, one of the other freshmen, came down and sat down beside me. And she said, Russell, I need to tell you something. I need you to start being a leader. You're the oldest person on this trip, and you're not being a leader right now for this group and for the youth group. But I know you can lead, and everybody's waiting. You can imagine I felt about this tall at that moment, but I could hear my friend's critique Because it wasn't just a criticism of how I had been living. It was a, I know you. And I know what you can do. And I see what God is working in your life. And I want to encourage you to actually do it. Holy Conversations asked the question, What are we being called to do? Who are we being called to be? Who are we being called to become? I believe that in this no, we are being called to be those who know each other well enough to welcome, to draw in, and if need be, challenge because we care about each other. The Next Steps group took that directive and said, if we are going to get to know each other better and know our giftings for ministry, then maybe the best place that we can begin to process this calling, this this beckoning to become something, is by taking part in a spiritual gifts inventory to learn how God has equipped us and prepared each of us to serve. As your pastors, we are going to encourage you in the days to come to take part in this during the month of March, during the season of Lent, a season of preparation, a season of exploration, of, of finding out what God is calling you to. We will encourage you to take part in that to take part in in that inventory, and you'll know more about what that looks like. That won't be the hard work, the inventory. The hard work will come after that. When you share your results with other people who know you, not to brag, but to say, this is what I got. Does this jive? Do you see this at all in me? We're going to encourage you to tell your pastors about, this is what I got. Do you see this in me? I've never thought this, but, and I don't even know where to begin and how to begin doing ministry with what others tell me, and this tells me that I have to give to others and to the world. 
That's a kind of knowing each other. That's a kind of opening yourself up, being vulnerable with one another. That's knowing one another. To do what my friend Beth did for me. To see gifts, to encourage, and to call out. But to do it in love, out of love, and for the love of God. Knowledge is a powerful thing. If we here at First United Methodist of Church of San Marcos want to grow, not just in numbers, in counts on Sunday mornings or Wednesday nights, but if we really want to grow as a church, this is something we must do better. This is something we must do to know ourselves to know each other, to know our gifts and to put them into work, to put them into work in the church, in this community, and in the world. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.